Hello, my name is Glenn Skelhorn and I am a Philosophy in Schools tutor for the Royal Institute of Philosophy. I also run the Philosophy for Teens organisation, delivering online philosophy courses and events for young people, and I've been teaching A-level philosophy since 2004. The focus of this video is the limits of knowledge, and I'll be looking at different forms of sceptical doubting and how the French philosopher René Descartes used sceptical doubting in his pursuit of knowledge. Since infancy, you have been involved in a process of learning from your own experiences, the influence of family, friends, school teachers, and so on. Most people would consider this as a journey of, at least in part, accumulating knowledge. As life progresses, we gain more knowledge, or so it would seem. But do we really know what we think we know? It is possible to question claims to knowledge, and much of this would fall under the category of normal incredulity. A friend's claim that they know their football team will win at the weekend, or that there will be light showers in the area this afternoon, these things can be doubted. Your friend might think they know, but you may be sceptical. Often a feature of normal incredulity is that such doubts can potentially be dispelled through the acquisition of further evidence. If you discover that the opposing football team are rock bottom of the league and will be fielding a very weakened team due to injury, you may cease doubting, accepting that your friend's team will win. This is different from what can be called philosophical scepticism, a form of doubting which is more extreme in its nature than normal incredulity with doubting applied not to everyday knowledge claims, but instead to issues that are more fundamental. For example, sceptical doubt that other people really have minds, or that it is possible to demonstrably prove the existence of God, or that there are moral facts about how we should live. These examples of philosophical scepticism are much more pervasive than normal incredulity. But, these examples are limited to doubting particular aspects of the world, other minds, God, morality, whilst leaving everything else untouched. As such, these are also forms of what's called local scepticism. However, there is a form of philosophical scepticism that is much more radical, sometimes referred to as global scepticism. This type of doubting is cast not on one element of experience or the world, but on the very nature of experience and the world themselves, bringing into question whether knowledge is in fact possible at all. Consider, I may doubt whether you know your football team will win at the weekend, but surely there are some things that you obviously know to be the case. For example, I know that I'm holding this book, and you know that you're watching this video through your device. The reason you know this is that all of your senses confirm this to be so. However, the global skeptic would argue that in actual fact, you don't know this at all. Why? Because at this very moment in time, it could well be the case that you are tucked up in bed, fast asleep, and you're having an incredibly vivid dream. In 10 seconds time, you could wake up and say, oh, wow, that was such a realistic dream. I dreamt I was watching this philosophy video about skepticism and knowledge. Now, this analysis is applicable at all times. As such, according to the radical skeptic, one can never be certain that what we experience corresponds to reality. I can't even know that there's such a thing as planet Earth or that other people really exist as this could also be part of my dream. Alternative thought experiments to the dream scenario have been introduced over time, including the brain and a vat hypothesis. Can you prove that right now you're not just a brain in a vat of fluid, stimulated to experience color, smell, sound, taste, and feeling, generating this grand illusion that you're sitting in your room watching this video? or the possibility that you're plugged in to a very sophisticated virtual reality game. It's hyper-realistic, erasing your memory when you plug in and downloading a complete bank 
of false memories that you now consider to be real. In addition, the ideas and arguments behind this kind of radical scepticism have been popularised in recent years through movies such as The Matrix, Inception, Existence and The Truman Show. But beyond the entertainment value of contemplating such radical possibilities, does global scepticism really have any use? With normal incredulity, we tend to doubt a knowledge claim if we believe it to be false. But philosophers who employ global sceptical doubt often personally believe in the knowledge claim they are subjecting to scrutiny. For example, a philosopher might formulate an argument to undermine the claim that we can know other people have minds, whilst at the same time personally believing that other people really do have minds. The rationale here is not to determine what we ought to believe, but rather to use radical sceptical doubting to identify what can actually be known for sure. This was the case with 17th century French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, who made it his mission to pursue knowledge and used scepticism as a means to achieve this end. In pinning down knowledge, Descartes intended to set in place a solid and reliable foundation for all future intellectual and scientific progress to build upon. A lofty ambition, for sure. Now, for Descartes, a belief can only qualify as knowledge if it is indubitable. In other words, impossible to doubt. The reason for this is that if you hold a belief, and it can be doubted, then there's a chance that your belief could be wrong, in which case it isn't knowledge. This then forms the backbone of his method, to test whether beliefs can be doubted or not. If a belief can be doubted, then it isn't knowledge, and if it is impossible to doubt, then it is knowledge. With regard to testing his beliefs, Descartes states, it will not be requisite that I should examine each in particular, which would be an endless undertaking. So instead, he groups beliefs together and tests them en masse, based upon their underlying shared principle. And so begins Descartes' Three Waves of Doubt. His first focus is on beliefs that are derived from the senses. Is it possible to doubt beliefs that are drawn from what we can see, hear, smell, taste and feel? He thinks he can, making reference to occasions when the senses have proven to be unreliable. Consider how a straight pencil appears bent in a glass of water. How squares A and B on this chessboard illusion seem to be so different when in fact they are the same shade. How the spinning pinwheel illusion quickly results in a distortion of vision. And the shepherd auditory illusion of continually ascending pitch when in fact it never changes. If the senses are not wholly reliable, then any belief based on the senses cannot be immune to doubt. The second wave of doubt goes even further when it comes to beliefs based on sensory experience. You might argue that the senses are reliable when we are not being subjected to illusions. But Descartes argues that the senses can be doubted at any moment in time. The example he gives is of his feeling of certainty that he sat in his dressing gown writing by the fire. How often has it happened to me that in the night I dreamt that I found myself in this particular place, that I was dressed and seated near the fire, whilst in reality I was lying undressed in bed. Descartes then employs the dream hypothesis mentioned earlier in the video, using radical sceptical doubt in order to sound out beliefs based upon the senses. Anything that one experiences could hypothetically be a dream experience, or as he puts it, I see so manifestly that there are no indications by which we may clearly distinguish wakefulness from
from sleep. The third wave of doubt focuses on the apparent building blocks of experience itself. Even dream experiences consist of component parts, such as colour, that perhaps must be drawn from reality. As such, maybe I can know that colour is a constituent of the real world. In addition, other fundamental beliefs seem to be immune to doubt whether or not one is dreaming. Namely, beliefs based on mathematics and geometry. Whether I am awake or asleep, two and three together always form five. It does not seem possible that truths so clear and apparent can be suspected of falsity. Yet Descartes concludes that even these beliefs can be doubted. Firstly, he considers the possibility that God exists and that God is all-powerful. If so, God would be able to make me think that 2 plus 2 equals 4, when in fact it equals a completely different number. Descartes, though, considers, hmm, possibly God has not desired that I should be thus deceived, for he is said to be supremely good. In short, it wouldn't be very nice of God to systematically deceive me about the nature of mathematics. However, Descartes has an alternative possible source of deception to God, namely his evil demon hypothesis. He writes, I shall then suppose, not that God, who is supremely good and the foundation of truth, but some evil genius, not less powerful than deceitful, has employed his whole energies in deceiving me. There is a chance however remote, that such a being could exist, and if powerful enough, could be the origin of my mistaken belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But let's remember, Descartes is using the methods of the radical sceptic here to ascertain beliefs that are impossible to doubt. It's not the case that Descartes is arguing that there really is such a demon. <laughs> At this point, we might surmise that Descartes has discovered the limits of knowledge, the rather bleak conclusion that we don't know anything at all. But in fact, he does reckon to have pinned down one belief that it is impossible to doubt, encapsulated in his famous proclamation, cogito ergo sum, or in his native French, je pense donc je suis, or in English, I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I am. What does this mean? Well, Descartes concludes that there's one thing he cannot doubt. That he exists. He can't know that his body exists because, of course, there's a chance that his body could be part of a dream. But he knows that he exists as a thinking thing, i.e. as a mind. Why? Because when you look at the statement, I doubt I exist, that doesn't work because the very act of me doubting entails my existence. I couldn't doubt if I didn't exist. And secondly, even if there were an evil demon, it could not deceive me into thinking I exist when in fact I do not as I need to exist in order to be deceived. Now, Descartes doesn't stop there and proceeds to build upon this newfound knowledge, discovering further claimed truths via deduction. But that's a story for another day. And I hasten to add that there have been many critics of Descartes' cogito argument who reckon that it isn't all it's cracked up to be. For now though, we have a concrete example of a philosopher employing the arguments of the global sceptic to test beliefs and ascertain what we can know. Thanks for watching.